Partners here based out of Minneapolis, and we do Rails, Groovy, uh, and a, a, some Angular JS as well. And I've been using Jeb for the past three years, doing functional testing on about half a dozen applications. I've written probably a couple hundred Jeb tests in that time, and I was using Ross Selenium for a couple years before that as well. And I'm a very minor contributor to the Jeb framework. I've got a little bit of code and a small section of the manual in there as well. And if you want to hit me up on Twitter or email if you have any questions uh, after the presentation, feel free to ask. And there's my, my Twitter and uh, an email as well. And at any time during the presentation, if you have a, a question, feel free to throw your hand up, stop me, and I'll, I'll do my best to answer. All right, we're going to cover uh, quite a few topics today. How many people are using Jeb today? All right, so about, about half the people. And when I submitted this talk for this conference, I didn't know if there was going to be an intro to Jeb talk or not. It turned out there's not, so this is the only Jeb one. So I'm going to include a quick intro to Jeb just so I try not to leave the people who aren't using it uh, um, today in the dust. Uh, but I also, at the end of the presentation, have a link to the video of a talk I gave two years ago at GreatConf, which was more of an intro to Jeb talk. So if you're interested in more of the, the syntax and kind of the getting started with it, that talk is a, is a good one to check out. So after I do an intro into, into Jeb, we'll talk about page objects. Then a lot of the built-in helpers that Jeb has to make writing your tests easier. And then a little bit about cross-browser testing, running the same tests in Chrome, Firefox, Internet Explorer, and, and so forth. And then a quick demo of being able to run your Jeb tests in parallel. As well as these last two items are not specific to Jeb, but just ways to help make writing any kind of functional test easier. So using Groovy remote controls for data setup, and then mocking out third-party services using fake versions using dependency injection. All right, so quick introduction into what Jeb is. So Jeb is a Groovy browser automation system built upon the Selenium libraries. And Selenium drive natively will drive your browser, so you can do automatic browser functional testing, and it supports a wide range of, of browsers. Jeb was created, just recently turned five, so created about five years ago, originally by Luke Daly. Now uh, the project lead is Marcin Urban. And it uses some nice syntactic sugar on top of Selenium. Selenium has a variety of ways to select elements, and it's uh, maybe not always the easiest syntax to use. So Jeb has a nice jQuery style syntax for selecting elements. So the same kind of, of way you would do it in jQuery, you can immediately transition that over into your, your Jeb tests. Jeb also provides really nice built-in support for page objects. Page objects are a great way to create more maintainable and readable tests. And there's a whole lot more, and we'll cover some of that in the rest of the presentation. So what types of applications can you test with Jeb? While Jeb is written in Groovy, your app itself doesn't have to be written in Groovy. It could be a J2BE app, or it could be some other system. I know some folks will test JavaScript MVC framework uh, applications with Jeb. Then Jeb, similar to Spock, can be a way to get Groovy into a, uh, an organization or a company. People can start using it in their testing world, realize, hey, I really like writing this code. So then they can uh, maybe transition that over into their production code as well. So a quick example of what the Jeb syntax looks like. Hopefully that's big enough for everybody to read. But what this test is doing is going to Google, searching for Jeb, and then going to the Jeb homepage. So there's the ability to go to a given URL. So here I'm going to go to the Jeb homepage. And then I'm going to select the input element, which name is Q. And then the Jeb homepage, that's the, or on, the, uh, on Google, that's the search box. So I'm going to search for Jeb. And then this button with the name button G, so that's the, the selector for the name again. And I'm going to click that. That's the search button. Then I'm going to wait for the search results to be displayed. And that's the uh, element with ID search. And then find the first one of the results. And this is a little, so I don't have control over what the, the Google homepage, what their structure is. If I was writing the page myself, I'd have more IDs in here to make this test a little easier to read. But this is the first link. And then search results, click that and then wait till I end up on the Jeb homepage. So that's kind of a, a quick example of the Jeb syntax. And we'll run that and see, see it in action. And all the code examples from this presentation are at the very end of the, of the links, and I'll tweet out the code examples and the presentation and also be available on the Great Conf um, uh, page as well. Move 
move this over so it's. And I put in some sleeps to make the test go a little bit slower. It's still pretty pretty quick. We can run that again. So the and this is firing up Chrome to to do the test. So it goes to Google, search for Jeb, click on the first link, and then boom, I'm at the Jeb homepage. All right. So there's a variety of selector syntax you can use in Jeb, selecting by ID, selecting by class, definitely two of the most common. You can select by any HTML attribute. So if there's no class or ID on there, for example, on the, the Google homepage, I can search by the name attribute. Or you can also select by text. So Jeb will go and grab the elements and look for the text. Now this, but when selecting by text, Jeb has to go and fetch every element that could match it. So you'll definitely want to not scan the whole page. That'll be pretty slow. You want to find a, uh, an element that's just a little bit above it. So the, the lowest level thing you can select with an ID or a class and then scan under that for something by text. And the full list of all the selectors is in the Jeb manual with that, uh, that link right here. So that test that I showed it's got a lot of HTML specific stuff in there. There's attributes, there's IDs, there's classes. I had to go through line by line and kind of explain what each line was trying to do. It's not very readable. Also, if I have multiple tests that are using the Google homepage and Google changes some of the structure of the page, changes the name of the search box and so forth, I'm gonna have multiple places to go and update in each one of those tests. I don't want that. Is there a better way to do this? Can I abstract that page specific stuff out of my tests and put it somewhere else that I could reuse it across pages? And the answer is yes, that's page objects. Now page objects are not a specific thing to Jeb. They've been around for a while, the idea of page objects. I was using them back when I was doing raw selenium a few years ago. And page objects, you take all the element information of the page and put it off into a helper class. That way you can reuse the element selection and so forth across different tests and you only have one spot to update if anything changes in those tests, th those pages. And the tests themselves also become easier to read as now you can define in your page object what that say field or button is called and it makes the, the test a lot, a lot more straightforward. So here's an example of that same test rewritten using page objects. So now I'm going to the, in this case, the page object class is um, Google homepage. So I'm gonna go there, fill in Jeb in the search box, then click the search button, click the first link in the search results and verify I'm at the Jeb homepage. And there my verbal description is almost identical to what the test is, much more readable than that first version I showed. Now here's an example of what the, the, the page object could look like for Google homepage. And in Jeb, all your page objects just extend the Jeb.page class. And there's a few different conventions here. One, all the elements are defined inside this content block here. So I have the name that I'm gonna use in my tests and then just that same selector. So I can just take the selector that I put in my old test, throw it right in this page object for the search box, search button, and then the search results link. And then I have the URL in here, how to get to Google. So that's how, why I can call that to method and then go right to the Google homepage. So I mentioned the elements on the page, how to find them. You can also optionally include a way for Jeb to verify the test is on the correct page. That seems kind of trivial, why would you want to do that? It makes debugging failures a lot easier. If you don't have that and your test ends up on the wrong page, maybe there's an error in the flow or something like that, and you end up on the error page, you'll get a, an error message like, oh, this element I was trying to find isn't present. Whereas it'd be a lot nicer if Jeb told you, hey, you're on the wrong page, you're on this error page instead of the, the way I expected. So that's kind of an optional way to, to do that. And then that URL, which you don't have to have, but if you want to go straight to the page, you want to define the URL to go directly to the page. And that can be a way to speed up your test time. Maybe you have an application with a, a bunch of pages underneath a login page. So every test has to go do the login, and then maybe you're testing a page that's five deep in the flow. Rather than having every test that wants to touch that page go through all five pages, because browser tests are, are a little bit on the slow side. You can log in and then just go straight to the page. So it can make your tests more isolated and a little bit faster to run.
since these page objects are just standard classes, you can also have helper methods in there. And I'll talk a little bit uh, more in a little bit here about some of the, the ways you can make writing tests a lot easier by including helper methods inside your page objects. So you got the content block with all the selectors, every element you're gonna wanna interact with on the page, so all the fields, links, buttons, all that good stuff, and then all the different selector syntax. So say I have an application where I can, I wanna record all the ideas that I think of throughout the day so I don't forget them. So I wanna be able to create an idea with a, a title and a description and then there's a button to save that idea to the database. So here I've got, got two fields and a, and a button, all with IDs. And then here's how the syntax to verify you're at the correct page, which is static at and then a closure that's gonna return true if you're at the right spot. So this one is gonna check and say, hey, is there a div with the ID, create idea on the page? If there is, great, I'm at the right spot. If not, Jeb will throw me an exception and tell me I ended up on the wrong page. And then if you wanna go straight to the page, the URL. So now I can call the to method and Jeb will go right to that spot. And these can be either absolute URLs or relative ones for the Google homepage. It was a absolute URL because that's outside of my application, but for a relative one, then you can just have the, the path relative to your application. Under the covers, Jeb keeps track of the current page you're on, so then it delegates method calls and field references from the test to that current page. So if you're gonna be changing pages, you wanna tell Jeb, hey, here's the new page I'm at, for example, clicking a link, submitting a form, that kind of thing. So to do that, there are several options you can pass to any of these fields inside the content block. One of them being two. So then I'd say, hey, this create button is going to send me to a different page, in this case, the idea show page. So I just pass in the class of the page object it's gonna send me to, and then under the covers, when I click it, so here I click the create button, and this browser.page is Jeb's internal reference to the current page. That's that class of that page is now idea show page. And there may be times where a specific button or link could send you to multiple spots. So in that case, instead of just putting one class there, you put a list. And if you do that, then you have to define the at checkers for each one of those possible pages. Because that's how Jeb figures out which page you really ended up on. Is it runs the at checker for every possible page in your list and then says, hey, whichever one of these things returns true, that's the page I really ended up on. So here, if my create button, if something goes wrong, Maybe it would send the user to an idea error page. So I would say, okay, it could be, could be show or error. And then I just give it a list of the, the possible choices. So that's kind of the standard, standard Jeb way to do page objects. And for the past couple years, I've been doing a slightly different way to do it. So I'll go through this, and this is totally optional, but for large test suites, you going this route can help can help save you time when reading and maintaining and writing new tests. So kind of the standard way, as I mentioned, Jeb delegates method calls, field references to the current page object in your test. So say here's a test that's gonna go to my home page and then try to log into the system. So after I call to home page, Jeb is internal references to the home page class, then I'm gonna click on the login button. That's gonna send me to the login page then there's two fields there, just fill in the username and password and click submit. And when reading this test, I'm not, it's not obvious to me, all right, what page am I on now? Where did submit send me? And what fields are available on that page? What can I do on that page? So there's, I've gone through a couple different names for this technique over the past couple years. The section of the Jet Manual is called strongly typed pages, so I'll go with that. In this case, the test keeps a reference to the current page and that's just a, a class instance. So then it uses that for any kind of navigation. So the to method returns the instance of the home page I'm on in this case. So I've got my instance of home page, and I put a method on there to click the login button. So then using, say, ID code complete and type ahead and all that good stuff, I now know what actions are available on the home page in my test without having to switch back and forth and try to figure out what page I'm on or, or anything like that. So when I click the login button, and this changes the page under the covers, so I've written this method to return me the instance of the new page, so now I have a hook into the login page, and I've got a, a method on that, that class to do the login, so that method abstracts away what fields have to be filled in, what buttons have to be clicked, and so forth, 
So the test reads a lot more like the, just the sentences I would write down to tell somebody how to run the test. And that makes writing the test a lot, a lot quicker as well. And then I know immediately that this login method returns the dashboard page, so that's the page I'm on now, and I can keep writing my, writing my test. Because each a method that changes the page returns an instance of the new page, you can chain these calls together and make this test even shorter. So this method right here, click login button, returns login page, but I don't do anything else with the login page besides log in and move on to the next one. So I can just chain all this stuff together. So once I'm on the home page, click the login button, and then log in, and I'm right on the dashboard page. So I can get an even shorter test. So a couple of the characteristics of this type. So all these page objects have helper methods on them to simulate the user actions. So that way things like logging in, filling out forms, and, and all that good stuff. And each method that changes a page, submitting a form, clicking a link, and so forth, those are gonna return me the instance of the page I end up on. So I can chain the call together or keep a reference to the, the current page. So here's what the home page would look like in this example. My login button is gonna send me to the login page, so I got my two definition up here, and then my method to click the login button, and this returns browser.page. So once I've called click, as we saw under the coverage, Jeb's gonna change the instance in browser.page to be the next page I end up on, so it'll return me now an instance of login page. And the login page has my username and password fields and submit button, so this login method hides the fact that you know, in this case, it's, it's pretty trivial. It's just filling in two fields and s clicking a, a submit button. But if you're filling out a, a large form or anything else bigger, it can be, can be really handy. For example, if I'm dealing with dates, so in the insurance world, you can add a, a dependent to your, uh, to your coverage. So you can say, I'm gonna add my spouse, my child, and so forth, and I have to include their name and their date their birthday. So I don't want to think about in my test, oh, is the birthday to, on the UI split up into maybe three different fields, one for month, day, and year, and all that. It'd be really nice if I could just deal with a date object, not have to do that, that conversion in my head in the test itself. So maybe if I want to do a, a, a Jota time local date object, and I can just have the page object deal with splitting that out and putting it into the, the three fields that it needs. So in this case, I have a day, month, year field for my birth date. And I just have the page object go and split and grab the day of month, month of year, and year fields to go fill those in. So my test is a lot easier to write, and it just abstracts away the fact that those, there are three different fields for the birthday. So it's a little bit extra work to write these types of page objects. You have to define all the helper methods. But I found that it really saves a lot of time in the long run for making tests easier to write and then easier to read after the fact. All right. So now let's talk about some of the, the nice built-in test helpers that Jeb has. And these, these are really handy. The, this, was, this was just last week, I read a blog article where some a company was using Ross Selenium, and they found that their tests were a lot more, more maintainable when they did several, several different types of things in their tests, and they were all things that are built into Jeb. So I thought that was pretty cool that Jeb is ahead of the curve there. One of the big things that helps me a lot dealing with JavaScript MVC front ends is waiting support. So we have a lot more dynamic elements on our pages these days. A lot of things change without a page refresh. So we need to wait for things to, like messages to appear, page content to change, all kinds of different things. You can even wait for if we have Ajax form submits that are maybe writing records to the database without refreshing the page. We can also use this to wait for new database records to be created and, and that kind of thing. And it's a wait for method. It's available in all your tests and all your page objects in Jeb. And it just takes an arbitrary closure, so anything that will return true. So essentially, so what this is gonna do is wait for a div with class alert to be displayed on the page. And Jeb has a pre-configured wait timeout plus interval when it checks, and you can override that if you want to. Or in this case, it'll wait for the a div with class message and text update successful to be displayed. So it's really handy when dealing with uh, a lot of dynamic pages. Jeb also has some nice syntactic sugar for dealing with complex UI elements. 
things like sliders, date pickers, and so forth, where you may have to move the mouse, use the keyboard, and that type of stuff. For example, if you want to click and drag a slider with the mouse, Jeb provides this nice interact lock and then some wrappers around the Selenium capabilities of moving the mouse. So in this case, I'm using a jQuery UI slider. So the handle, the thing you click on to drag the slider, its class is UI slider handle. So that's the, the content element there. And then this slider has ticks that are 100 pixels apart. So when I'm moving the mouse, I can tell it how far I want to move it. And then this interact block here is telling Jeb, all right, we're going to start using mouse interactions now. So the first thing it does is click and hold on the slider, because I'm going to click and drag this thing. So I click on it, and then I move it by a given x and y. Because it's a horizontal slider, it's only going in the x direction. So say in this case, maybe 200 pixels to the right, moving the slider two ticks over, and nothing up and down. So zero for the y, and then release. And that's all it takes in Jeb to click and drag the mouse. You can use it for drag and drop, all kinds of stuff. It's, uh, it's really handy. So we'll do a quick demo of what that looks like. And this mouse interaction is supported in almost all major browsers. Fire up here. And again, there's sleeps run in here to make it a little bit easier to see. And it goes through all possible accommodations of the slider here. can also use the keyboard. Oh, yep, question back there. Safari. Yeah, so the once we started testing in Safari, we had to switch over to using the keyboard to move our slider around. So you can, Jeb provides a nice syntactic sugar. You can use a left shift operator to send keystrokes to any element. For example, if you want to fill in the input field by having it simulate every letter in the string value, in this case, like somebody typed in the, the letters on the keyboard, this is how you would do it. Or if you want to send other characters, or other, other key commands that are not letters, you can specify anything in the Selenium keys enum. So as I mentioned, we had to convert our mouse movement over to uh, using the arrow keys once we started testing in Safari, because it didn't support using the mouse. So in this case, I can move that same UI slider just using the arrow right key demo of what, what that looks like. So this is the same test, creating ideas with, with ratings, but in this time using the keyboard instead of the mouse. So you can see kind of a going through the different tick marks here. So we'll start off at two, and then go over to two, then three. The code for both those examples is included at the end of the slides. And last but not least, if you have a UI element that you've tried to use the mouse and the keyboard to work with, and it's just not happening, you're sinking too much time into trying to, to deal with this problematic element, Jeb provides a way to just execute raw JavaScript. So you can do things, every navigator element, so that's every selector, and Jeb just has a dot jQuery field. So you can run jQuery stuff on it. You can call show, you can call even date picker methods. We had a form or a, a date picker where the input part, so if you, you can't, was read only, people weren't allowed to type in the date and it was really difficult to deal with. So finally we had sunk enough time in trying to, to do it the nice way and we said, all right, we're gonna call the jQuery date picker function on this thing and just set the date and move on and start writing some more tests. So it's, it's really handy. Also, Selenium doesn't support interacting with any kind of hidden element. So if you have something like a drop-down that you have to mouse over to see, sometimes that can be a little hard to deal with. If you don't want to have to try to get that right, you can just call dot .show. So in this case, it's, so if I hidden link here, it's dot .jQuery to execute the JavaScript. And then I can ex execute the jQuery show method and then click it without any, any issue. All right, now let's talk about cross-browser testing. So you can use Jeb 
with any browser that has a Selenium or, or WebDriver library. So the real browsers out there, and the major ones, Firefox, Chrome, Internet Explorer, Safari, all of that, as well as simulated browsers, like HTML Unit or PhantomJS. Folks have written WebDriver wrappers for those browsers as well. And there are some trade-offs there if you want to figure out, trying to determine which browser you want, want to support in your testing. And to be able to use a browser in Jeb, there are a few steps you have to go through. First off, you have to have the dependency for the Selenium library for that, uh, that browser. Some browsers require an operating, sy operating system specific driver as well to be able to interact with. You have to get that thing. You have to write a section in the jebconfig.groovy. So Jeb has a, a config file. You don't, out of the box, Jeb works fine with its defaults. You don't have to do anything. But if you need to customize things like adding browsers, changing wait times, all that stuff, there's a lot of configuration parameters you can override in there. So this is a section where you specify a different environment which is just a, a browser in the, in the Jeb world. And then you have to tell Jeb which browser to run. So those, those four things, we'll run through what each one of those looks like. So first off, you have to have the, the driver dependency. So if you're using something like Grails or Gradle, this is how you could define the driver dependencies for Chrome, Firefox, and IE. And then that Selenium support, you just want to include that regardless of which browser you use. And in this case, I define a variable for the Selenium version, so I have one spot to update when I want to upgrade a new version of Selenium. Another nice thing about Jeb is that it's decoupled from the version of Selenium. So some libraries out there are heavily tied to a certain version of Selenium, so you have to wait for those folks to update when Selenium upgrades. But especially now with auto-updating browsers, a lot of times the Selenium folks have to go and make changes to support newer browsers. So being decoupled, you don't have to rely on the Jeb folks to release a new version before you can start using a new version of Selenium. So that's really nice. And then there's this operating system driver. Firefox doesn't need one of these. A lot of folks test with Firefox out of the box. But if you're using Chrome, Internet Explorer, you have to have a local executable. And you have to tell Selenium where that is before you can run tests with it. So you could manually and download and install this thing, configure it on every machine where you run tests, or you could have Jeb do it for you. So I originally got this idea from Tomas Lin's blog, but you can have, because Jeb config, even though it's a config file, it's also a Groovy file, so in there you can execute code, and that, some of that code could be downloading the driver for you. So I have an example of how to do this, and this is up on the, uh, in the example project, I won't show the whole thing, it's pretty huge, but this is part of what it looks like to download the Chrome driver. So Selenium comes with a, the ability to figure out what operating system you're on. So here this switch statement's gonna go through and say, oh, am I on a Mac? If I'm on a Mac, this is the, the zip file name and the executable name to run this Chrome driver. If I'm on Linux, it's this, Windows and so forth, and then this is the URL to go out and, and download it. So I have some code to then go download it, and it's a zip file, so it'll extract it for you. And then you have to tell Selenium or WebDriver where that executable file is, so this does that for you as well, sets a system property, and then now you can use Chrome without having to worry about downloading this thing on either your local box or on a continuous integration environment or anything like that. And then last but not least, you have to tell Jeb which browser you're on. So by default, if you haven't defined any of these environments, It'll just pick whatever browser or whichever driver instance you've created first. But if you have a separate one like this one, I've defined the environments here to be Chrome. So now I need to just to pass the string Chrome in the jeb.in environment variable. And this is a, what you would do for Grails, but it's the same thing if you're running through Gradle or any other, other build system. And now Jeb will run the test in Chrome. Now let's talk about running tests in parallel. So browser functional tests are a little bit on the slow side, definitely slower than unit tests, a lot faster than running the, the same steps by hand. But if you get a large enough test suite, it can take a little bit of time to run the thing. So to be able to run the test in parallel could save you a, a big chunk of time. So what, what do you need to be able to do parallel testing? First off, you have to be using a build tool that supports running tests in parallel. This, the example I have is using Gradle, but Maven does as well. The tests, and this is a big one, if you have an existing test suite, your test cannot be modifying the same set of shared data. 
if your tests all have the assumption that they're going to run one after the other, and they're modifying any kind of data that each one uses, you can end up with a lot of headaches of all kinds of weird intermittent failures when tests are modifying the same data. So if you have a large test suite with a lot of shared data, it can be a huge time uh, and resource intensive operation to get these things run in parallel. So it's definitely better off if either you have a test suite with no shared data or you're starting from scratch before you start uh, trying to do things in parallel. So yeah, the safest way, and actually this is probably safer in, in serial testing as well, is just have each test be responsible for creating its own data so they don't have a bunch of shared data to start with that any test is mutating. For example, if you have one user with all your tests you're using and you have a test that goes and verifies what happens when that user is disabled or locked, then what happens if they, the, that test locks the user while another test is running at the same time trying to do it? And, and there's, there's all kinds of, of problems that could, could happen there. So this example is using Gradle to run a Grails 2 app and then run that Grails 2 app's tests in parallel. So this is a little bit of a, a contrived example and I'm hoping now, because Grails 3 is using Gradle as a native build system, one of my, the next things on my list is to try and see if I can get Grails 3 tests running in parallel without this uh, kind of hokey integration. So I'm using Gradle, because that supports running tests in parallel. And then I'm using that to just run the Grails wrapper to start up the app and then run two tests simultaneously. And then Grails has this little known feature where you can stop the application by creating a file called, I think it's dot kill run app in the directory where Grails is running. So then it'll shut down for me after that. And that's what the, the Grail file is doing. So let's do a demo of that. So this is Gradle, but first it's executing Grails under the cover, starting it up in the test environment, just like it would if I was running the functional test through Grails. All right, now Grails is running, so now it's gonna fire up my tests. There goes one, and there's the second. I'll move these aside so you can see there's two running. And it runs those in parallel. And that's a small test suite, only six tests, so it doesn't save a whole lot of time running them in parallel. But if I had a large suite, a couple hundred tests, I could save a, a decent amount of time by running them side by side. And you can configure as many parallel executions as you want. There's a little bit of startup time, as you saw, starting up the browsers. So depending on how large your suite is, you could spend more time starting up than you do save if you have a lot of run in parallel. But if you have, say, 100 tests, you run four at the same time without a problem. All right, so that's all the Jeb-specific parts of the talk. Next, I'm gonna talk about a couple things that can save a lot of time when writing functional tests. These will apply if you're using Jeb, Selenium, you're writing API tests, anything like that. So this is about the Groovy remote control. So before I get into what that means, what, do I, what is this useful for? Can I ask you one question before you leave the Jeb? Absolutely. Absolutely. So for the video, the question was, what, uh, what about running tests headless? And one thing you can do is use a X virtual frame buffer. That's what I've used for all my, my Jenkins boxes because they all don't have a, a, a monitor hooked up to them. And it's uh, just built into Linux. It's really straightforward to just have your, your CI environment start that thing. And then you can run any kind of real browser with it. So yeah, that's a good question. But yeah, that X virtual frame buffer. So remote controls are great for doing data setup and then verification, grabbing data after the fact. As you could drive your UI to generate data that your test needs and then go and run the parts of the test you want to verify and then use the UI to grab the data afterwards, but that's a lot, that's, that can be pretty slow. So it, and it also makes your test dependent on areas you're maybe not interested in, in testing. So you can use remote controls to specifically set up the data you need for that test, and it's using code, so it's a lot faster than driving the, the browser to do it. And then you can grab the, use the same technique to grab data after the fact to verify the data was created or, or updated. And then you can use this for 
retrieving set of data from mock services, which I'm going to talk about in just a little bit. So how does this work? So in the test environment, and you would only want to do this in a test world because this is running a, a servlet inside your application that will accept arbitrary code and just execute it. So you don't want to have this in production. That's a huge security hole. But it can be really handy in your test environment. So then you can have your test, and because we're using Groovy, just create a closure, send that over to your running application, and executes there. And the Grails, remote, there's a Grails plugin for this. You can use it also in any any project. Uh, Luke Daly made the remote control plugin, so it's also since he made Ratpack uh, built into Ratpack as well. The original re remote control plugin docs were part of Codehouse, so when they when Codehouse went down, we lost those. But the the, the ones in the Grails plugin are uh, are pretty are good as well. So an example of what this looks like, you just instantiate this remote control object inside your test, and then you can give it an arbitrary closure. So in this case, I have a Grails app with GORM where I want to create an idea. So it's just a GORM object. I set the fields, and then call dot save on it inside my my remote closure and then I can get that back. Whatever is returned from these closures has to be serializable, because it's coming back from your application onto your, your test, but as long as the idea is serializable, then you're, you're good to go. So now I can create data for data setup inside my application much faster than if I was driving with the UI. So what this might look like in my test, one of the, the tests in the example project wants to do the, the list page, list out all my ideas with five ideas on it, so rather than go and use the create page to generate five ideas, that would be a lot slower than just doing, writing them straight to the database using code. And then after the fact, if I was creating an idea, I could go in and grab the, the idea out of the database and verify all the fields got set up after the fact. All right, so now let's talk about how to mock out third-party services. And there are a lot of different techniques to do this. In fact, the talk right after this is about a different technique of mocking out third-party services. Um, yeah, they're all, all good. So nowadays, our applications have a lot of different third-party services that we're using. There are services out there for email, payment processing, address verification, storage on S3, which is great. So there's all these, these ways out there so we can be much more productive in building our apps. We can focus on building the part of our apps that makes them unique. But it also makes our testing a little bit hard because now we're depending on all these services which may or may not have test servers we can use. Those test servers may go up and down. They could be slow to use. I don't want my test to be failing when I'm trying to verify my app works just because some other third party's test server is down. So is there a way to, how do we want to handle this? I want to mock out the call and response to these services. As my tests are focused on verifying my app works correctly and it works, it interacts the way I expect with a third party service, but I want to have a lot of control over that. I don't want my test to be dependent on that service being up. I also want to be able to simulate all kinds of responses, error responses, how my app handles that. I want to have really tight control over how the external service responds in my test. So the way that I've done it for several years is use dependency injection. So if you're using a dependency injection framework, like Spring with Grails or any other Spring application or Juice, the first time I did this was a Scala Lift app with Juice several years ago, you can replace, use dependency injection to override services or beans during your test environment. So you can replace them with mock versions. So in this case, you want to, and you probably want to have this anyway, move all of your code that interacts with a service, external service in one spot so you can easily replace the code there and not have it sprinkled out throughout your application. And then when you're running your functional tests, use your DI framework to just replace that service, the part of the code that interacts with the external service, replace that with your own test version. And then you can, by using a remote control, interact with that mock service during your test to maybe set up data, set up the responses it expects, give your test, has really tight control over how that, that service is gonna respond to simulate the scenarios it needs to verify your application. So for an example, I have my application where I can create ideas, and maybe I think some of my ideas are so good, I want to submit them directly to the patent office. Now, this is assuming the patent office has a, an API. They probably don't. They probably don't want people just submitting random stuff to them. But assuming they did, so say I had a, a service 
with a method on it called send a patent office that would do whatever is necessary to, to submit my idea straight to the, the patent office. Now I wouldn't want to do this when I'm running my tests. I don't want to flood the, the patent office with all the random test data I'm using. So I want to replace this during my tests. So to do that, I just create a fake version of it. And I, so I extend the, the real patent office so then I can override the single method in there. I would do, if I had multiple methods, I would override the, all the ones that interacted with the real patent office. So in this case, I override send the patent office. Instead of hitting the real patent office, I'm just keeping track of a list of all the ideas that were my test attempted to send to the patent office. So in the Grails world, you can use the resources.groovy to either create your own beans or override existing beans. And a lot of other, uh, you can do this in standard spring with XML. And Grails has the notion of an environment. So during functional tests, the environment is set to be test. So in this beans definition, I'm gonna check, okay, am I inside a test environment? If I am, I'm gonna override the patent service bean. It's all services in Grails are instantiated as beans, single set beans. I'm gonna replace the, and I specify the class that I wanna use, in, in this case, patent service mock. So this is gonna go in and replace the actual patent service with my fake version during my tests. So here's an example of what this would look like for a test that uses this mock service. So I like to take rem my remote controls and wrap classes around them to make them kinda like, almost like a page object for my remote control so I don't have a bunch of remote calls inside my, all my tests, I just have a nice abstract layer that I can use to interact with the remote control. So in this case, I go and I use the UI to generate the idea. And then on the idea show page, this call right here, submit idea to patent office, this is the one that's gonna use my mock service. So once that idea is submitted to the patent office, I'm gonna go and use the remote control to grab the idea out of the database and then verify that it got sent to the patent office. So I'm gonna go and you fetch the list of ideas out of that mock service and just verify that the one I created is in there. So then that, that's how I expected my application to interact with a third party service. I didn't actually hit the real, real thing. So then what that would look like in code, this idea of remote control as a method to go in and access the mocked version of the service so in the Grails world, the Grails plugin provides a hook into the application context, which has every bean in there. So you can do something similar to this if you're not in a Grails app, but the Grails app plugin makes it a lot easier. So I can go and this patent service is gonna be an instance of my mock patent service. So I just go, I've got a public field in there with all the ideas in the patent office, so I can grab those. They're serializable, send them back over the wire to my tests and verify the, that they work as I expected. All right, so we'll finish up here. If you wanna contribute back to the Jeb framework, there are a bunch of different ways you can do it. Jeb has a mailing list. People ask questions on there. Feel free to come and Joe, go and jump in and try to help answer questions. Uh, Marcin Erdman, the current project lead, is also very active in there, so if you have any questions, feel free to ask them in there. A lot of times he'll be the first one to respond. You can contribute back to the Jeb manual. I think it's called the uh, Book of Jeb. It's very good documentation. And they have, they'll have to have pull requests to add new information there as well. And you can also grab a small issue and start contributing back to the, the Jeb framework itself. Jeb has a ton of internal tests, so it makes it real easy to add, say, fix a bug or something like that, add a test that reproduces the bug, fix it, and submit it in the PR. Um, it's a great, great project to start getting your hands, hands dirty if you want to start contributing to open source. And here's a list of a bunch of different resources. I mentioned the manual, the user mailing list. Jeb has a couple examples out there, the official examples for using it with Grails and with Gradle. Also a link to the most of the examples that I use in this presentation, including the one for running tests in parallel. And I also created a example project for using Jeb with Grails 3. Jeb is built into Grails 3, so there, that actually was very trivial. <laughs> so it wasn't even uh, yeah, worth mentioning here, but Grails now includes a command to create functional tests, called create functional test. Uh, where you can go and generate your own. Also a link to that intro presentation I mentioned I gave a couple years ago for the folks who, who haven't used a lot of Jeb and wanna learn more about the syntax and so forth, go watch that video. And then the Jeb source code. Sometimes uh, it's really uh, easy to understand, very well segmented out. If you wanna go in and really dig and understand how it's working under the covers, the, the source code is a great place to go check out. All right. What
questions the folks have. Yeah. All right, so the question was what kind of uh, testing for, for mobile does Jeb have? So I know we don't do any mobile testing my current uh, client, but I know some folks have used uh, Appium, which is a, a Selenium web driver version that works with mobile support. So then you could use Jeb to then drive your Appium tests. All right. Oh, another question. All right, so the question was, how do you deal with the slow startup time of an application when you're trying to write tests and it takes a few uh, few minutes to start it up? You can, so if you're doing just standard, the built-in to say Grail's way to run Jeb tests, it's gonna start the server for you and then run the tests, but you can run Jeb tests against a running server. So you can start up your tests, or start up your server, you know, it takes a few minutes, and then just leave it running and run your tests against it. So that can be a way to speed up development if it takes a long time to, to start up the app. So you, in that case, you would pass in the URL, and there's documentation in Jeb Manual on how to do that. Pass in the URL to your running server, and then Jeb won't try to start the app server. It'll just go and hit an existing server. So that can be a way to save time. Okay. Oh, another question. So the uh, I'll tweet these out, and they'll also be on the, the Great Conf has a, uh, a GitHub repo with a link to everybody's slides. All right, thank you very much.